All right, so you're watching a never seen before Q and A I did on stage at the Man of War conference in December 2019 before the pandemic. I answer a question about business, entrepreneurship, finance, leadership. Let's check this out. As I mentioned yesterday, I came out of the Marine Corps as my seventh year in the Marines, and uh, I stumbled into entrepreneurship. I never thought I'd be in the business world. I was a door going on the helicopter, and uh, let alone never thought I'd be in the insurance industry. You, know, you got a Wall Street background. I never thought I'd be in the insurance industry. I was horrible, horrible with money. But make a long story short, I made a career. The last 20 years now, I've been in the insurance industry. The first 12, I was an independent agent, just seeing 60, 80 clients a year. And then in 2009, 2010, I had a client keep looking at my chair during an annual review. I'm like, bro, what, what, what are you doing? Pay, pay attention. Going over your retirement account. Oh, dude, I like your chair. This is 09, 2009, 2010. I said, dude, the difference between your chair and my chair is this. So drop it. What you got? He goes, the difference between your chair and my chair is what happens when we both get up. Says, what are you talking about? Says, when I go get back up from my chair when we're doing this annual review, I go back to my dead end job. I know what I'm gonna, the, mon the money I'm going to make, the salary I'm going to make. I know the life I'm going to live in the next year, two, three, four years, maybe incremental five, ten thousand dollars difference. Then I'm selling off into the sunset. You, you know, on the other hand, you get up from your chair. You do what you want. You call your own shots. You take, you know, take your, your wife out for lunch. You take your kids out for lunch, uh, you pick them up from school, you take them out to lunch, you call your own shots because I like your chair. And it was at that point, Ralph, I was like, you know what? I think I need to teach this guy my industry. I don't even know how to, how to get you licensed. I got licensed when I was in California. You get licensed, I guess, by taking an exam somewhere here in Illinois. And I didn't even know. And so it was at that point, another client came in, another client came in and said, I like your life. I want to I want to live, you know, what you're doing. And it was at that point, I realized that provided me the, the data and the feedback it says, you know what? I need to duplicate myself to other people because people will love to do what I did just as somebody did to me in 1999 to get me involved inside this financial services industry. So anyway, make a long story short, we went from, we went from uh, myself as an individual sales practice to become a mini sales manager. We had 27 guys and we scaled, we've got over 2,500 agents across the country and including Puerto Rico. And uh, I go coast to coast. We have offices in, in uh, Northern California. We got offices in San Diego. We got offices in, in Memphis, Atlanta, Dallas, San Antonio, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, Jacksonville, Orlando, uh, Fort Myers, and Miami. So we got uh, people all over the place and nobody can tell me that we don't work because we've duplicated our system in multiple places because everybody needs the product that we sell, which is money and financial freedom and to build a life. And we, we're blessed with this kid because this is a, we, we've got five kids now, but this is the first kid out of the four that we've, uh, my wife and I have had together. It's our bridge kid. <laughs> it's, it's, our, it's our kid we've had together. So I had three to begin with and she had one and there's our bridge kid. And it's interesting because I've been working at this thing for 20 years, but the first time we've ever had a kid between the two of us where we're not worried about money. We're not worried about financial issues. We're not worried about uh, what we can afford. It's a different, different uh, scenario. And I think I'm so thankful about entrepreneurship. I'm so thankful thankful about capitalism. I'm so thankful. My son's back there and you know, and uh, the last time we were down here was up in Hollywood, Florida because I qualified for a company paid trip. And so he, we, we took him there and it's funny because uh, I, I exposed him to this world of the insurance world and financial services. I was figuring it out, he was figuring it out. But it's interesting now that my son is here as an adult, as a 24 year old young man and he's experiencing manhood and, and other examples of success because there's only so much I can tell him. <laughs> because he doesn't see the world. I, I break it down to three phases of parenthood. You know, the first phase of parenthood is idolize. You know, Papi, I love you, da, 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 right? You, I, you know, my dad is stronger than your dad. My dad's faster than your dad. And then we fall into the second phase somewhere around the 12, 13, 14 year old range, which is demonized, right? <laughs> right? You, you do nothing right as a parent, right? <laughs> you don't know nothing, dad, right? And the, until they slip into the humanized phase until they got to buy their own toilet paper and toothpaste and they can make a living and top ramen noodles just like I did. And then they, so I, I call that the humanized phase. So idolize, demonize, and now humanize. I think he's starting to fall into the humanized phase because he wants a relationship. He wants to have a better life. So, Great, yeah. So. Make it work. Yeah, so between the two of us, I never got her involved into what I'm doing initially. My first date with her was a, was a group date, and I brought her around that group. I wanted to see her in an element outside of just me and her and her. You know, with most dates, people are putting on their best face forward, right? And sometimes it's superficial. But this time around, I was a little bit more intense around. Get, get, I want to get her around friends. I want to see her out of her element to see how she socializes and whatnot. And she took it like a she took it like a champ. And she just was engaging. She was bright. She was personable. She was charismatic, and, and she represented a different side of me. I'm like I'm thinking to myself at that first. Day. Can I see myself with this woman for the rest of my life? And uh, so that's uh, that's how we fell into it. How did you apply your systems and processes and the culture that you have now? Right. You know, because I see you on, on Instagram, you know, on Facebook, you know, your videos where you have, you know, 100 people in your office all like dancing around, having fun, <laughs> and I'm like, shit, man, that's pretty cool. <laughs> I, I want to know how I, how I do that. Yeah. You know, so um, talk to you about that. So, so, so from an operations standpoint, uh, marketing standpoint, so we break it down to what makes us money. Uh, what's the most important thing? The number one responsibility of an entrepreneur is to make money. The second is to, to create jobs. And so, so I figured out, okay, babe, I do this really well, do this really well, this really well, this really well. I'm okay at this, and I'm okay at this, and I'm okay at this. 
do you have any insight to doing this? She goes, oh, I love to do that. I love to do that. Oh, so we find a role for her to naturally do. And then there's one or two, three roles that we didn't like to do. And so that's when we started to hire an assistant or staff for that particular operation. And then when we hire people, we have a, a standards expectation. You know, usually job descriptions are things that you forgot about after firing the last person. <laughs> Yeah. That's why you create a job description. And so we said, here's the basic functions that you need to do for fulfilling this role, because that's your unique ability. That's what you're being hired to do. And then we're going to judge you on three different roles. We're going to judge you on your speed of which you do this job. Number two is your skills. Did you did we hire you and do you have skills as advertised? And number three is citizenship. Do you not just do the job? Are you are you just, are you punching out at five o'clock right away? Or are you actually growing a position? Because I want to pay you more. So those are the three things that evaluate our, our guys on speed, uh, citizenship, and skills as advertised. And every time we, we do that, we improve or, or fire. So what do you say to guys like, for example, you know, switching gears, maybe they've done something in their life, like, you know, you were a Marine, mm -hmm. guys are either coming out of the military or they're just changing career path and they're just a little bit fearful going out there to the unknown as an entrepreneur, right? Because right. The entrepreneur, being an entrepreneur, there's a lot of unknowns. What advice would you have? The biggest thing for me, the biggest catalyst, because I was in the insurance industry for 12 years, but I've been working directly with a mentor the last four, you know you know him, uh, Patrick Ben David, host of Valuetainment, and he's specifically impacted. So in other words, I've accomplished more in the last four years than I did my first you know, you know, 12, 13, 14 years because of a direct mentor. I thought I could wing it. I thought I can do it. I'll just give it a shot. I, you know, I wasn't very specific. I didn't have specifics. And I think when you're making a transition in your 40s and your 50s, you can't really make a lot of mistakes because you pick your head up, you're 50, you pick your up, you're 60, you pick your up, you're 70. And oops, I wish I had done this 20 years ago. So I think what a mentor uh, has allowed me to do because I told my mentor, here's some specific questions. Here's an outcome I want. Give me a formula. It cannot be based on talent because talent isn't scalable. I need to scale my business. Now, if there's talent that I need to bring to the table, then it's my personal brand. But it can't come to my personal. It can't come to the overall business because the business needs to still function without me. You know, right now we've, we've got multiple meetings going on. I've been away from my office for for two weeks, and our business is still functioning. You know, I, I'm still rocking and rolling. Guys are still doing. So I work with a direct mentor that holds you accountable to the decisions that you make, and don't be so ego minded that you get butt hurt by, about them uh, course correcting along the way. Because I got no time to waste. If you're just starting out. On social media, YouTube, or any, let's say, just creating content. Yep. Uh, do you have any tips or suggestions or strategies or anything you'd like to? to share as far yeah. as growing your audience? Yeah, so number one is, is figure out who your ideal audience is, who's your target market. And um, you know, in sales, it's go wide to find potential clientele, go wide. You know, go wide this, go wide that. You know, like Netflix, you know, they have a new release every week. You know, movie theaters have a new release every every two, three weeks, right? They're going wide. So in social media, it's the opposite, it's going deep. So you gotta find out who you really wanna talk to. So when I, when I started social media, I said, my mentor said, who do you like to talk to? I said, I like to talk to veterans, I like to talk to athletes. I like to talk to people who have a faith, whether it be Muslim, whether it be a Christian, whether it be Mormon, whatever. Matter of fact, my, my financial mentor and my business mentor initially were, were Mormons. So I learned a lot from Mormons and Jewish and Jewish folks than I did my, my Christian family in my local church. And so you got to figure out who you want to talk to. And then when you're talking on camera, when you're writing content, when you're doing podcasts, when you're writing an, an article, you're talking to them, right? Because what happens is people that were probably on the outskirts of that target demographic, they get intrigued by it because a part of your story they, they resonate with too as well. So no one is figure out that avatar. Figure out who you want to talk to. Uh, number two, create a consistent social media schedule. So we have, we have a production schedule schedule every uh, Sunday, we release content. Every Wednesday, we release content. Every day, I have to post on social media. Six to 10 times a day, Instagram stories. You know, just talking about your, 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 your stuff. Like for example, you know, this morning, a ton of stuff was just based on the workout. You know, posting six to 10 stories. Because people wanted to see, they want to humanize you. You just can't be somebody that, that puts up a brand and, and what is the conclave? What, what is the my smart guy? What is PHP? So what, what, I want to see if these guys are real. Because I had people that have been following me for six months to a year, finally say, okay, I've had enough. What do you, what's the next step? I don't know who you are, but they want they want to move forward. So, you know, so you're building relationship indirectly uh, with social media. Because here's the thing with phone calls. You make a phone call for a sales call, uh, you hang up the phone, that conversation is done. Social media, you post content. Uh, six weeks, 12 weeks, six months, a year goes by, people people who still watch that stuff. And then people reach out, hey, I really like your video. Which should we do? And you find out there's a video posted two years ago. The third piece of content is write down the 10 biggest questions people have about your business. What's the 10 biggest objections people have about your business or your product? What's the 10 biggest concerns? Right there is an episode, you know, or, or you can you can release that once a day. Hey, hey the, the biggest con uh, concern people have about my, my widget is this. The top five things that people do 
when they look for my product, right? So you want to write content in that regard because what, what happens is you, you social media is a salesperson, a person that's marketing for you day in, day out. And, and number four, don't be afraid of the camera. You're a good looking dude anyway. By the way, I think more people are critical of how they look on camera versus how they sound. So be, be, be conscious of how you sound and how you come off your tonality, your mannerisms, you know. Uh, if you want to create a brand about something, be consistent with that brand. For example, I'm wearing a shirt right now because I know it's going on social media called Entrepathlete. Entrepathlete is, 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 is how we treat business like sport. Like I want to treat my business like I'm an athlete, right? I, I, like sleep is so important to me. Whole like, uh, uh, Rachel gave me the whole tones. And I said, babe, I woke up and I said, babe, I'm jacked up. I'm like, I got so much sleep. I'm like, I'm asking him today, bro, can I hack my sleep? Can I get less sleep, a deeper sleep? <laughs> he said, I said, I'm like, can I get four hours of sleep with his whole tones at the Delta level, you know, because I want to, I want to get back to work. I want to you know, shoot out the house. So that, that'd be it on, on social media. And, and, and number five would be a look for people in your space to do collaborations. Uh, one of the conversations I want to have with Sawman is, is have a piece of content that we can do and I can interview folks in that area to drive value to the people that are following me on, on social media. Because the people aren't going to look at you as a brand anymore, they're going to look at you as a resource. Looking forward to it, man. Let me know who, should I, who I should follow. So, so send me a DM. Okay, got it. Hey. Very good. Langford. There you go. You have a lot of success as a producer. And yep. Also, I'd like to talk about how you build a team that big and how do you manage those relationships so that you still stay personal and engaged with your customers. Because that's the thing that people don't understand. Like, it's like, yeah. So the first thing as a producer, I had to learn how to sell. I, w I wish earlier on somebody taught me how to sell. I think I learned how to sell maybe my fourth or fifth or sixth year in. And uh, and once I learned how to sell, and once I obtained certain skills to learn how to sell to specific to my product, because in our in our industry we have an intangible product. What we sell is a promise. So you buy something for 100 bucks today, 10,000 bucks today, you're not going to get it today. Unlike a house or a mortgage or doing your taxes or or a whole tones type of product, you can get immediate results from it. So you and I sell a product that most people never see the benefit that they provide. Right. So. So you, 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 you need to find a way to make it intangible, tangible. So those are the specific skills, uh, sales skills that you need to attain. The second part about sales skills is uh, figuring out the common objections that people have when you're selling that product. So therefore, you're automatic with it. You're automatic with the repetitions. Like I remember uh, one time in my, my sales career when I was a producer, I woke up in the middle of sleep with a nightmare because somebody told me that they changed their mind. Like, no, 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 I, I, and I'm overcoming an objection in the middle of my sleep. And I'm looking around, just, what the hell am I? <laughs> right? But uh, you, you want to have those those objections on an automatic. The third thing is when you are selling, when you are overcoming objections, make sure that you're listening, not in the back of your mind looking for a way to, to overcome your objection because you think you think you're about to overcome your objection, but without empathy or perspective, you may incorrectly pitch or incorrectly uh, uh, overcome the wrong objection when really that's not where it's coming from, especially in our world because guys don't buy insurance because they're moving macho. And so, um, you know, so that, that's the thing, especially in the world of, you know, I started making money. And the thing about the sales world, especially in our world, you know, I, I didn't want to go to my client in a fancy car. Now, a different story when I'm recruiting because I want to sell people my, my field, my company, but when I'm seeing with a client, especially being conservative in me handling their 401k or handling their insurance, I, uh, I, had, a, I had a different car for that versus the car I would ball out with, you know. So just 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 keep that in mind because as much as you don't think it, people are judging a book by its cover. And so if that's the case, we'll make it a you know make it the cover that you want people to see. What would you recommend? How would you start? Where would you start? Where yeah. Would you, what would be the first step you would take? Now I'm talking for my 12 year old when when, but really I'm talking about myself. Here. Right. So, so when I came out the Marine Corps, it was difficult for me to be in sales because what did I, what didn't I hear for eight years? I didn't hear no. I didn't hear I'll think about it. I didn't hear call me next week. So I was my, my program was all jacked up for sales because that's what you need. You need patience with sales. You need volume with sales. And so when I reprogram my way of, of selling is number one, automatically condition myself to start asking questions. If I ask questions with authentic intrigue about their problem and then asking them how they're solving that problem, then that's an opportunity then for me to provide my solution. So finding a problem, finding out how they're solving a problem, if they're not really solving their problem, number three, then, then I can answer by asking a question, well, would you like help with that? Would you like assistance with that? Because what I found myself early in my sales career is I was telling, I was telling people what to do. You need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do this, you need to, I don't know, people are like, no, I don't need to do shit. You need to tell me what to do. It's my money, I get it. But if I show them a problem by exposing a pain, if I can't find their pain, I can't move them. But if I find their pain and, ex and educate them in a way that explains the consequences of allowing that pain to exist, then they want a solution. And sometimes if, 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 they, if they want a solution, they'll, they'll, they won't think about the, the price for it. The unique thing about my product is I have a sliding scale to my product. Hey, well, can you save a month? <laughs> Right, so we don't really have a price point for saving in your retirement account. The problem I have in my, my field is getting people just to get started, right? And that's
that's that's an inherent problem there. But number one is finding people's problems, asking questions, being genuine in, in asking questions and listening to where they're coming from, and then find a way to insert yourself at that point, and and also understanding why you are different from your competition, right? And you, most most times it's because of the relationship with you. Good stuff, man. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. So much. I appreciate awesome. It. Thank you, Conclave. Thank you.